Hello folks, I welcome you to our broadest church worship service on this Memorial Day weekend. Uh, I'm Phil Peacock, the pastor, and I appreciate you tuning in with us. Um, for those of you who have been in the armed forces, or maybe still are in active service, I thank you for your service. And uh, for every family that has lost a loved one standing up for liberty and for justice, our condolences and our gratitude for your sacrifice. Uh, on this Sunday, May 24th, uh, we will have a drive-in service uh, at both of our church campuses, 9 o'clock here at the Paul Green campus, 11 o'clock at the Hebron campus. Uh, but we also wanted to make this service available to you online. Uh, if you know a high school, college, or grad school graduate from our church, uh, we want to get their information of, of where they're uh, graduating from, uh, where they're going, what their degree is, that kind of thing, because we like to honor our graduates on June 7th. So families, you can help us out in getting this information in. Uh, also, beginning June 14th, our plan is we are shooting uh, to begin inside in-person worship at our Pole Green campus. Uh, the services, there will be two, will be at 9 o'clock and 11. This is a little different than our older schedule. Uh, we are going to be practicing social distancing. We're going to be wearing masks and other safety considerations. And I would just say for more information about how we're going to do this, look at your June newsletter from the church. It should be coming out next week. And our Hebron campus is going to continue doing drive-in services, at least for the month of, of June. It's working well there, uh, but the time in June is going to move from 11 o'clock to 9 o'clock because it's going to be getting warmer. Also, uh, I hope that you will check out our new Meet My Pet segment, uh, the clip that's on our website, and considering in sending in your own video or pictures of your pet so that you can be part of it. It's really cute and it's a great way to stay connected. Now let's enjoy our vocal ensemble as they lead us in worship. Well, hi there, it's Miss Karen with a message for the children. You know, God knows everything about us and he knows the good stuff and the bad stuff, right? He knows that we're really forgetful. And he also knows that many times the things that we forget are the great things that he's done. Way back in the Old Testament, God revealed his plan to help with that problem. After one of his great miracles, God gave Joshua these instructions. So listen to this. He says, choose 12 men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to go into the middle of the Jordan River and get a stone and then carry it to Gilgal, the place where you will stay tonight. These stones will be used to create a memorial to the people of Israel forever. In the future, when children ask, what do these stones mean? Tell them all of the people crossed the Jordan River on dry ground. 
God did to the Jordan River the same thing that he had done to the Red Sea for Moses. He dried it up until everyone had crossed over. He did this so that all the people of the earth would know that the Lord is most powerful and should be honored and feared. This story points out that God wants children to know about the past and to understand the reasons for the things we do in the present. This Monday is Memorial Day. It's a day for remembering our past. It began in May of 1868 and was called Decoration Day. The graves of the soldiers who died in the Civil War were decorated with flags and flowers and wreaths. And then in 1971, it became an official holiday on the last Monday of May and was renamed Memorial Day. And it's designed to honor and remember all of America's soldiers who died in any war protecting our freedom. We do enjoy a lot of freedom in America, don't we? We're free to live where we want, to worship how we want, to eat whatever, and to learn all kinds of things. We choose what we wear, what we say, what we read, and what we want to be when we grow up. People in other countries dream about the freedoms that we have, but these freedoms weren't free. Many courageous men and women gave their lives to earn them. America is truly the home of the free because of the brave. Will you pray with me? Father God, we are thankful for all of the soldiers who gave their lives in any war for the cause of American freedom. We ask that you would bless each family who lost a father, a mother, a sister, a brother, an aunt or an uncle, a niece or a nephew, a grandpa or a grandma, or a child, or a cousin. We thank you so much for loving us and for hearing our prayers. And they all said, Amen. You guys have a wonderful week. Fly that flag on Memorial Day, okay? Bye. some years ago, but I, I remember having a, a rather strange dream. It was not a scary dream. It was not a morbid dream. But in my dream, I was dying, and I knew it. And so I could remember gathering family uh, around and having the time to talk to them and what, you know, I thought was my, my last moments. It was kind of a, a solemn and sacred uh, occasion, and, uh, you know, I, I knew I had words of wisdom to, to share. 
Unfortunately, you know how dreams are. I woke up and I thought through the dream. I thought, wow, that was really something. I thought, what did I tell them? Because I thought, what would be so, <laughs> you know, these profound words of wisdom that I would have? And I could never figure it out. And that really frustrated me. But you know how dreams are. Now, this morning, I want to read something to you that Jesus said to his disciples toward the end of his ministry. He knew that his time with his disciples was growing short. So what would he say? What words of wisdom, what advice, what insight would he give them in those last hours? Now, John chapter 13 is the Apostle John's record of the upper room and the, the Last Supper experience. Jesus knows that his crucifixion is right around the corner, just a few hours away. So he spends some time, some quality time with his disciples, sharing with them things of utmost importance so that they can carry on his witness and be messengers, his messengers, to the world. So here is what Jesus said uh, just after Judas slipped out of the room in order to go betray him. He says this, and I'm going to start here at verse 31. He says, when he was gone, when Judas was gone, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. A new command I give to you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you should love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Pray with me. Lord, I pray that you would give us a few minutes today to hear this message, to read your word, and to understand. That we would understand the difference between your kind of love and the love we see so often practiced in the world around us. But also, Lord, that we would hear your call to be like Jesus to act like Jesus, to think like Jesus, and to love like Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Now Jesus, as he talks to his disciples, he refers to his, his death and his departure, and then he gives this farewell command, love one another as I have loved you. Now, is that it? Nothing more complex, nothing more theological wouldn't he maybe take that opportunity to tell them how they ought to divide up into denominations or to somehow, you know, to organize or manage the church? Maybe he should give them some words about the Christian dress code, what we ought to be wearing. Maybe he should tell them what translation of the Bible they should be using. Or, or maybe what is the proper method of funding missions. But no, he didn't touch on any of that. Instead, he just told them to love. Jesus said, this is a new command. But what's so new about love? You can go into the Old Testament and find quite a bit about love. Leviticus 19.18 says, love your neighbor as yourself. God's instruction to love one another is, is an old commandment. But Jesus was right. His command was a new one. Because of the qualifier, as I have loved you. That's the clincher, isn't it? It's kind of like when Paul told the early Christian men to love their wives. Now, if he said that, they could all say, well, of course I do. Of course I love my wife. But then he added, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Loving like that is a tall order. Jesus, through his own example, 
always set the bar very high. And so it was a new commandment because of the scope of Jesus' love. Now the Jewish law had set boundaries for you know, how much you had to give, how much you had to forgive, uh, how much you had to love and who you had to love. But G Jesus blew away those boundaries when he said, as I have loved you. Love became the new central ethical reality of the Christian life. Not just any love, but God's love, the greatest the world had ever seen. Now, the disciples had previously been identified by physical association with Jesus. You know, that they traveled with him and worked with him and, and uh, camped with him, all of that, fished with him. But now, in his physical absence, when he would ascend back into heaven, they would be known by imitating his attitude and his actions, demonstrating his love. So for the past several weeks, we've been talking about life with one another. That's been our worship series. And uh, one by one, we've been looking at the one another statements in the uh, New Testament. And so today we look at the most important, the most foundational one another command. And that is love one another. What did that mean to the disciples when Jesus said it? And what does it mean for us today? Well, Jesus' love was an unmerited love. Uh, there's a lot of different kinds of love. You know this. Unfortunately, in English, we tend to use one word, this word love, to mean so many things. Sometimes it means affection or that we like something or someone or we desire something. Sometimes we use the word love when we really mean lust. Now, the Greeks, they had four or five different words for love, whether it was romantic or friendship or, or family. And all of these were, were dependent on something. Uh, uh, a person or a thing of beauty, of kinship, of a give and take mutual relationship. Only agape love, which found its truest definition in Jesus Christ, was unconditional, unmerited. There are no limits, no boundaries on this kind of love. Romans 5 8 says this God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. His love must be accepted, but it doesn't have to be earned. We can't earn it. In Scripture, it is agape love that is commanded to us. The others come naturally for us, but the ability to, a, to agape someone, that's a God thing. We need him working in us for that to happen. Now, how often do we put qualifiers on our love? You know, if, if they're nice to me, I'll be nice to them. I'll love them. Or I'll, I'll love the people who are a lot like me, you know, who talk like me and act like me. Or I will love people that can pay me back sometime, where they can show me some love in return. But agape love has no such qualifiers. It's what we call undeserved or unmerited love. But we also see in the life and ministry of Jesus that his love expressed itself in service to others. John 13 tells of Jesus washing the feet of his disciples with a, a water basin and a towel. Now, considering the dusty roads of the day, that was really a disgusting job. But Jesus did it, and then he said, Do to each other what you have seen me do to you. That's a hard thing. The world teaches us that our aspiration should be to be served. The rich, the noble, the powerful, they all receive service. They don't serve others. But Jesus gave up his heavenly throne in order to serve us. I'm going to share with you a few verses from Philippians 2. Here are a few right now. Philippians 2, 5 through 7 say, Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ, 
who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. And so Jesus went out helping people, serving them, healing them, feeding them, comforting them, bringing hope, bringing joy. So the question of service, when we go out and we interact with people, starting right with our own family and friends, is not how much must I do, but how much can I do? Now Jesus' love was expressed through his service. It was also expressed through his sacrifice. The old story is of the, the chicken and the pig. But one morning they, they see this that this poor man who's down and out on his luck, he's truly starving. And they both felt very sorry. They felt pity for the man. So the chicken said, let's go in together and, and feed this fellow a hearty breakfast of bacon and eggs. And the pig replied, you know, for you, that's just a gift. But for me, it's real sacrifice. Real love is always willing to pay a price. It costs something. It's expensive. Love benefits someone else's account, not our own. I remember the story of a girl who asked her boyfriend, Do you love me? And of course he answered, Of course I do. And then she asked, Well, would you die for me? And surprisingly he said, No, I, I wouldn't do that. And she said, Well, why not? And he said, because mine is an undying love. Well, we need to be careful how we define undying love. Because the Bible teaches us about a love that is so deep, it sacrifices even oneself. John 15, verses 12 and 13 says this. Uh, Jesus says, My command is this, Love each other as I have loved you. Sounds familiar. And he says, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Well, tomorrow, Monday, is Memorial Day. It is a day set aside by our nation to pay tribute to those who have died for the good of others. Those who considered serving their country and their communities and their families more important than even their own lives. Where can a person learn that kind of love? Well, it comes from Jesus Christ. He gave himself as a sacrifice that cannot be repaid. The closest that we can come is to follow his example. We probably won't be asked to, to give our death for someone, but we are certainly asked to give our living for people. Philippians 2.8 goes on to say, Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. A man asked Jesus, How much do you love me? And Jesus said, I love you this much. And he stretched out his arms and he died. So Jesus' love expressed itself through service and through sacrifice. And his love was also a saving love. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The love of God through Christ has the power to save to save us from Satan, to save us from our sin, to save us from ourselves. You know, even if we were to die for someone, like jumping on a grenade, and, and plenty of people have done this kind of thing, but we can't save them from their sin, or we cannot give them eternal life. But Jesus came to give eternal and abundant life. He paid the debt that we could not pay. When Jesus was nailed to the cross, he died as humans die. 
in his physical body were the results of dehydration, shock, blood loss. On his back were the lash marks. On his hands and feet were the, uh, the spike marks, the nail marks. On his head was the crown of thorns. But experts say it was none of those wounds that would have killed a man on the cross. Rather, it was probably suffocation from the uh, eventual inability to lift oneself up to breathe. It was a horrible way for the Son of God to die. But it was his complete sacrifice that showed the full extent of his love. But the sacrifice was complete in another way. It would never need to be done again. The book of Hebrews expresses this in the clearest of terms. From chapter 7 it says, Unlike other high priests, he, talking about Jesus, does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all, when he offered himself. Chapter 5, verse 9, it says, He became the source of eternal salvation for all. You know, the need of the Jewish sacrificial system ended when Jesus said, It is finished, while hanging on the cross, when he bowed his head and he died. It will never need to be done again because it was the complete act of love and grace that has the power to atone for every sin. The love of God through Christ can save, nothing else. Our love should prompt us then to want to share that love with others. Evangelism, sharing the good news of Christ's love, ha has been uh, described as one beggar telling another where to find food. You know, within ourselves, we have nothing worthy to offer, like a beggar has nothing to offer. But our testimony of God's grace in our lives, that might be what someone else needs in order for them to accept the saving love of Christ for themselves. Jesus' love is unmerited, serving, sacrificial. It's forgiving. It's saving. Jesus was right when he said, this is a new commandment. And you know what? Of all God's commands, this one's the hardest for me. It's the hardest because I, I think I am by nature selfish, as most of us are. I realize daily that I don't love others as Christ loves me. But I have to keep trying. It's the key to the Christian life. Other things matter, but not without love. And so we've got to let the love of Christ flow through us. It will be our identifying characteristic. Not our clothes, not our fancy Bibles, uh, not our mastery of doctrine and theology, not fancy prayers or the amount of money that we could put in the offering plate we will be identified by demonstrating Christ's love with one another and for one another. It has to start in our families and in our church, in our neighborhood, and then it even stretches out into the world. This morning, I'm asking you to deepen the love that you have for people who are around you, everyone you come in contact with, Every day, pick someone and say, I'm going to somehow show God's love to them. Don't let it be a selfish love. Don't love with thought of gaining something in return. Learn to serve. Learn to sacrifice. Learn to lead people to the Savior. Can we do it? Yes. Will we do it? We must. But if you're listening to me this morning and you've never accepted the love of Jesus Christ for yourself, then until you do, you can never truly know what love is. It's time that you make the commitment of your heart to Him. Here's a prayer that you can share along with me. 
Dear God, I know that I am a sinner in need of salvation. Today I claim the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus, as the payment for my guilt. I ask you to forgive me of my sins and to cleanse my heart. I also believe that Jesus rose from the grave in victory, so I want to receive him as my Savior and my Lord. Fill me with your spirit so that I can have the strength to live a holy life that pleases you and that I might learn to love others as you have loved me. Thank you for the gift of salvation through your love and grace. Amen. Now, if that prayer expresses a desire of your heart, the faith in your heart, I encourage you to share your decision with people that you love. I also hope that you will share it with me or with your own pastor if you go to a different church. It's a decision that ought to be celebrated. And each day from now, from this moment on, you can grow to be more like Jesus.